you know who I am. I just wanted to ask a little bit who you are and just tell us what your name is, where you're from. And um, I think what we might want to do is have just a little bit of uh, additional Q&A on this topic. And then what I thought we might do is, is think about what can we be doing to, uh, as, as citizens and activists, uh, weigh in on the issues related to the excessive US nuclear spending and ways in which uh, we can reduce the threat of nuclear war. So um, folks get settled in. If we just go around real quick and tell us your name, my scribe. Oh. Many of the organizations that were working for a nuclear weapons freeze in the 80s um, are still in existence. The Arms Control Association, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Women's Action for New Directions was created at the same time. Uh, Friends Committee of National Legislation. Um, who else? Peace Action. Peace Action, Action of course. I mean, it is, it was, I mean, it was the Nuclear Weapons Fruits Campaign and then became Peace Action. Um, there are some new organizations uh, that have kind of entered uh, the equation that are peace organizations first and nuclear disarmament <coughs> organizations second. There are some organizations that are good government organizations like um, the Project on Government Accountability we work with because they are into good government and ending wasteful spending and so they weigh in on some uh, nuclear weapon spending debates. Uh, there are uh, other religious organizations uh, that have a presence in Washington. Uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is very active these days. Um, uh, the Catholic Church may have its problems on some issues, but on nuclear weapons, they, they got their line straight. And the Pope has spoke out very strongly, and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is thinking about how to weigh, weigh in on the burgeoning new, new nuclear arms race and nuclear weapon spending issues. So there is a, a there is a kind of a new coalition. The Back from the Brink campaign is um, uh, the product of uh, four organizations coming together, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Union Concerned Scientists, and two others that I can't, not, can't recall, to try to come up with a very simple, as, as Ira Helfand put it, a simple prescription for nuclear sanity. Um, that can be uh, pursued at the local and state, and what we're going to try to talk about here is at the national level. Who's PSR the third? Did I not mention PSR? I think Say I did. That first. Mm -hmm. Okay. PSR. With PSR, you, I'm sorry, you, Union Concerned Scientists. Um, Peace Action. Peace Action. Okay. So it is many of the the, the, the familiar core organizations mm -hmm. that have been part of the, the movement for a long time. So it is a it is a, 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 what I would say, a mini campaign at this point in the US that was launched in, in 2017. And it has um, expression in a number of state and city council resolutions that have been introduced. Um, uh, the state California, the California State Assembly just passed a resolution supporting the policy prescriptions in the Back from the Burn campaign that Ira spoke about. Um, uh, State Senator Queen here in Maryland has introduced a resolution that's similar, that is about uh, uh, preventing the president from having the sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. And I think, I don't know what the status of that is, but there's going to be, a, there's another session on that. So it has its, its expression. Queen will be here to discuss that. It's later today, yes. okay, yeah. Okay, and one more question, then I'm going to So at the end of the talk, you mentioned the, uh, uh, intermediate range nuclear weapons treaty that the U.S. is uh, thinking of pulling out of. Yes. And so I'm hoping that you would spend some time in uh, talking about efforts that are currently underway to oppose that, especially in light of the recent elections. And yeah. Some hope that the House may oppose that move. Okay. So um, let me talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the nuclear weapons spending uh, challenge and, and how we can address that. Um, so as I said in my presentation, I mean, one of the main challenges we face is that the two key treaties that are still in place today, the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that limits the long-range weapons and the Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty are in jeopardy. So on October the 20th, President Trump said that he would terminate the INF Treaty. Why? Uh, because Russia has uh, been 
has tested twice a missile that exceeds the range allowed to treat. I have not seen the U.S. intelligence on this that suggests that it, it was tested beyond the limits allowed, uh, but I've spoken to people who have. I think the Russians have violated the treaty. The question is, has the United States and Russia done enough to uh, they exhausted all the diplomatic options to bring Russia back into compliance? The short answer is no, they haven't. There have been two meetings in the last year uh, to talk about this. They haven't been very productive. Uh, the U.S. doesn't recognize some of Russia's concerns about U.S. compliance with the treaty. You, know, you get the picture. There's just not a lot of conversation going on. My honest opinion is that the, the well, our assessment is that we probably have about two months before Trump formally notifies Russia we're withdrawing. So there are very few opportunities left for a solution, and I am not optimistic. So I think the thing we need to concentrate on is, uh, and what Congress can have can weigh in and on, on and do something about, is not INF, which may be a lost cause, but it's the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which, if you think about it, is more important in the sense that it regulates weapons that exist on both sides. Um, uh, the INF Treaty prohibits weapons that no longer exist because the treaty prohibited 20 years ago. So, I mean, I think that is a more immediate challenge we face. And Congress can do something about that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And this, this is what this handout is about. Uh, there is a bill that uh, has been introduced by three Democrats. Um, Menendez of New Jersey, the ranking Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee. Warner is the Intelligence Committee ranking member. And uh, Reed of Rhode Island, who's the, on the Armed Services Committee, calling on the US to agree to extend the New START Treaty by five years beyond 2021, as long as Russia complies. So that's what you know. I think Congress can actually have a positive impact on. So, um, all right. So there are many other things we can get into, and we can we can come back to them. Um, but I wanted what I wanted to come back to uh, to, to start the conversation is um, as we look at the 1.2 trillion dollar plan over the next 30 years for U.S. nuclear weapons spending, um, we need to think about what are the main messages and themes that we're carrying forward when we speak to members of Congress, when we speak to fellow activists and citizens. What are we looking for? Uh, what's wrong about this? And I want to make this a bit of a conversation. Um, Sally had a good suggestion about one of the ways in which we should talk about this um, instead of talking about nuclear weapons modernization, which sounds pretty good, right? Everyone wants to be modern. Uh, what's wrong with that? Instead of using the modernization word, or the word I use, recapitalization, because they're replacing old systems with new systems, same purpose, uh, there's some upgrades. Let's talk about it in terms of no nuclear weapon shopping spree, no blank check. Come on in. Uh, no blank check. So the language we use about this is crucial uh, in terms of the policymakers we talk to, the yeah, op-eds we write, the letters to the editor we put together. Um, I think we need to we need to think carefully about that. Um, the other thing I didn't mention in my talk, but it came up in the Q and A, is we do need to be thinking about how we communicate these numbers to ordinary people. To no, translate no, no. I'm this just saying big here. number, one point two two trillion dollars, into something that people can understand, um, and um, so, what does that mean in terms of you know, U.S. student loan program, the infrastructure bill that people in Congress are talking about, healthcare costs, etc. So there are ways to break this down in our materials and our talking points into um, numbers and items that people can relate to much better. The other thing that I was talking about, I was talking about is we need to get across the point that um, with, with 
members of Congress, members of the public who may think we need nuclear weapons for our survival to deter Russia and other countries. Uh, okay, let's not argue about whether we need nuclear weapons or not, whether we can get to global zero. But what we can make a good argument on is that we have far too many nuclear weapons than we need for nuclear deterrence purposes. So I think part of our message really needs to focus on the fact that we've got excess nuclear arsenals today. We need to be moving as rapidly as possible towards global zero. Um, and then the other main theme that I think is important, and I'm interested in other people's thoughts, is um, that we need to reduce the risk of nuclear war. You heard Ira give his talk, which I've heard it several times, but every time I hear it, it scares the blankety blank out of me. <laughs> um, so what can we, we, we do? And as, as he and I were both saying, there are three very important things that members of Congress and, and policymakers can do. One is eliminate the launch under attack posture, which calls for the United States or Russia to retaliate immediately with about 800 nuclear weapons in case there's a sign of a launch under attack. We need to adopt a no first use policy, which is that we will not be the first to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapons threats. Um, and another thing that we can do that relates directly to the nuclear weapons force and the spending, we could begin to move towards eliminating the land-based intercontinental ballistic missile force, which is one of the areas that the Pentagon wants to <coughs> replace. Why is that particular system important? Because that is the leg of the triad, one third of the US nuclear force, <coughs> that would uh, be involved in this immediate response to a um, uh, threat of uh, an attack. So those are some of the things that um, I think are important to be uh, pressing forward on in our work with legislators. So I've got some thoughts about a couple of specific uh, action uh, items that we can be asking members of Congress to support in relation to these things. And then there may be some other ideas and questions about other things that we can be uh, doing. Um, and the first is, let me come back to the, this legislation I mentioned about uh, the New START Treaty. Um, and that, that was in this little handout I sent out, sent around. Mm -hmm. So as I said, the, there is a risk that President Trump and President Putin will not extend the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. If they don't decide to do so in the next two years, there will be no legally binding limits on the world's two largest arsenals. So we can, through our members of Congress, particularly in the Senate, weigh in by encouraging them to support uh, the legislation that Senator Mendez and others have introduced, or by simply contacting our senators and members of Congress about the need to extend the New START Treaty. And this is a, an excerpt from one of the recent action alerts that the Arms Control Association sent, sent around. Another thing that we might be talking about is it's a second, second action alert here, is to encourage members of Congress to support a no first use policy. And uh, it's quite amazing that the incoming chairman of the Senate, the, the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith from the great state of Washington. Isn't that where you're from, Kathy? No? No. No, you're in Colorado. Sometimes right. I wish I was. Sometimes you're from <laughs> Seattle. I mean, anyway, uh, some good ideas from, come from Seattle. And Adam Smith is suggesting that the United States adopt a no first use policy. First time ever that a chairman of the Armed Services Committee has suggested that. Not even Ron Dellum suggested that uh, when he was the chairman. So that's something that we want to try to, I think, get other members of Congress, whether Republicans or Democrats, to endorse. Now, is this going to change Donald Trump's opinion? Any, any thoughts? No. OK, that's what I thought, too. Uh, but this could help shape the views of other Democrats in the House, other de Democrats in the Senate. And where's the next 
Democratic presidential candidate going to come from? Might be from the House, might be from the Senate. If we can make this the mainstream Democratic view, and maybe there, if there are some Republicans that support this idea, you know, it could become the policy approach of the next presidential administration, whether it's in two years or God help us in six years. So that's another thing that I think is important to be pursuing. Um, so let me stop there and see if there are other thoughts or suggestions. I mean, and I'm going to call on some of you who are working on this with me in Washington for your ideas. Um, but uh, those are some things that I would that I would outline. And what we might want to also talk about is if you've got questions, ideas, suggestions about reaching your members of Congress, what some tools and techniques uh, and strategies <coughs> might be. So, and you guys have spoken before, but I just want to see if there's anybody else who wants to, okay, why don't you go for it, sir. Uh, there's one more idea, is to encourage Congress to reassert the war powers. In other words, Congress has the power to declare war and not the U.S. President alone. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. I mean, and this relates to nuclear weapons use. Um, so, as many of you know, uh, there is another piece of legislation that was introduced in 2016, actually, before President Trump came into office by Senator uh, Ed Markey of Massachusetts and Congressman Ted Lieu of California. I can't remember off the top of my head the, the bill numbers on this. S200 and HR669. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so this these bills are in the House and the Senate. Um, they are slowly gaining co-sponsors. What this bill would do is it would require that Congress must provide authorization for the first use of nuclear weapons. So as we all know um, from our political science classes, uh, Congress acts for it very slowly. <laughs> it might take a little while for it to authorize the first use of nuclear weapons if it ever does that. I mean, so essentially, this make, would make it, if it could be put into law, impossible for the president to launch a new pre preventive nuclear strike against North Korea or a bolt from the blue attack against Russia. Um, I think this is a very good way of raising awareness about the fact that the president today has sole legal authority to launch nuclear weapons, and nobody else has to give him an OK. And once he gives this order, there's no taking it back. It's great about raising awareness. Can this pass? Probably not, even in this Democratic <coughs> Congress and in the House. Um, but it's an important educational tool. So it's another thing, I think, to, to emphasize and to try to get additional members of Congress to, to support. So, I mean, as it relates to nuclear, there are other war powers questions that are out there as they relate to the war in Yemen and other cases, but that's another conference. Other thoughts, suggestions? Yeah, so when you're talking about excess nuclear numbers and, you know, this money that people want to spend, <coughs> um, I would focus on those weapons that actually make things more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could comment on which one of those that might be. I think the dual capable mm -hmm. um, missiles would be one of those, and maybe um, increasing the land based missiles would be another because they're the ones that, that you could. Well, it, it's a good question. I mean, so there are a couple ways to look at this. I mean, um, as I said, I think the the most dangerous part of the existing U.S. nuclear force is the ICBM force. Why? Because it is designed to respond immediately to uh, a launch by, a massive launch by the other side. And it would also be a target. And it's a target, okay, yeah. yes. Um, and actually some advocates of the ICBM force say it's important because it's a sponge for the other side's mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and it draws attacks away from cities. Okay, well, that's what, that's, <laughs> uh, that's what they argue. Okay, so I think, you know, one of the, one of the, the things I would zero in on is uh, making the argument that we don't have to have ICBMs at all in order to deter a nuclear attack against the U.S. because, I mean, Ira Helfen mentioned this, the United States still has a very large 
uh, nuclear force on its undersea submarines. At any given moment, there are about eight very large nuclear armed submarines roaming the seas. And even if the Russians tried, they couldn't find every one of them. Um, uh, so I think this is one area to focus on. Another argument, however, that one we might have to make is, well, it might be a little dangerous to, to eliminate it altogether. I mean, there are lots of pros and cons arguments you're going to hear on Capitol about maintaining three, a three-legged triad. So one argument to come back with is, well, we don't have to have 400 ICBMs. We could phase out the existing Minuteman three ICBMs. It's the existing type. Um, we could move down to a 300 ICBM force or a 200 missile force, and we could stop, cancel the program to replace the Minuteman III. That would be another argument <coughs> for a member of Congress who's a little less, a little more reluctant to give up an entire leg of the triad. Um, I would also just note that in this, we just conducted this interview with the uh, incoming chair of the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith, and we asked him specifically about you know, which part of the U.S. nuclear arsenal would you, are you going to be looking at in terms of reducing costs, and he pointed to the ICBM force. I mean, he understands these arguments. So I think we've got a, kind of an open door there, at least on the House side, not so much on the Senate side where Senator Inhofe, uh, very hawkish Republican, is going to be very gung-ho for every one of these proposed uh, replacement programs for the arsenal. Now, the other way to answer your question is there are these low, so-called low-yield, um, and I would call them nuclear war-fighting weapon systems that the Trump administration has proposed. Um, and uh, I didn't really get into this in my presentation, but every administration puts together a, a nuclear strategy that's a little different from the previous. So the Trump administration came out with its nuclear posture review um, about nine months ago, and it uh, kind of expanded the circumstances in which, under which the United States might contemplate the use of nuclear weapons first, including some non-nuclear weapons scenarios like if Russia attacked Estonia and if Russia threatened the use of nuclear weapons, we might consider using low-yield nuclear weapons in this conflict in the Baltics. Okay? And we can't really defend Estonia very well because it's right next to Russia already. Mm -hmm. So what they propose as part of their review is we want to equip some of our sea-based missiles with not high-yield warheads, which is what all of them have right now, but uh, we want to equip, equip uh, some of them with lower yield, as in five kilotons, about half the size of bomb. Making one of those could work out Estonia, probably. <laughs> well, I mean, Estonia is small. <laughs> a small nuclear weapon is enough. So yes, if I were in Estonia, I would not feel very good about any of this, uh, or Lithuania, or uh, so. That's what they're proposing. Okay. Now the problem with this, and there's a lot of discussion about this with uh, on the Hill with the opponents of this, of this proposal is uh, the Defense Department and Department of Energy can actually do this relatively quickly. And so they're probably halfway through the process of building these lower yield warheads because of the nature of the, the work. So we probably have one more funding cycle um, in which we might be able to stop additional funding for this program. So in connection with this, there is the, and I'm going to ask you again, Cassandra, for the bill number, the Line Act, okay, the, the how was it? Hold the Line. Hold the Line Act, okay. And it stands for Low Yield Nuclear Explosives. Hold the. Hold the line, you get it? Okay, hold the line. Okay. Does it have a number? And uh, yeah, it's HR 6840, um, and I actually have a book of the Senate, Senate version. Also, all of these numbers will change in January. Yeah, and that's so the reason why I, short term. That's one reason why I didn't come with these numbers because there's a yeah, new Congress coming change. in. So look for the new Hold the Line Act. Okay, and that but they're looking for co-sponsors now. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
And it's so you Senate can still contact your member of Congress. That's Senate right. 3448. That's the Senate companion of right. this bill. But I think the main message is we want you to support an end to funding of this yes. so-called low-yield uh, warhead for the submarine <coughs> missile. Yeah. So those are good, good questions. So, I mean, you know, how would you go after the nuclear weapons budget and, and which part of it you go after partly depends on what your personal concern is and what your philosophy is. Um, and it also depends on who you're dealing with. Um, you know, here in Maryland, uh, you know, the two senators I think are much more open to some of the arguments you're hearing about from people like Ira and me. Um, if you are in uh, Virginia with Senator Warner, might not be so much the case a little bit more conservative. If you're in a state with Republican senators or members of Congress, uh, if you may have to use some of these other arguments that are focused more on the cost savings and, and the deficit arguments. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one question and one comment. So um, I'm not real steeped in these issues. and. When I talk to uh, congressional aides, they try and put you in a silo. Like, that's not our committee that has to go through this, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess our, our response might be, for those of us that aren't experts, is you know we don't have enough funding for our schools. Like you say, it's a, it's a, it can be a spending issue that we can bring up and um, just hold our feet to the fire that way without getting into the specifics. But one thing I did raise that I got a response to was that this nuclear upgrade would actually make things safer because the uh, whole arsenal is getting very unsafe. So how do you respond to that? Okay. Well, your first question is a really good one. Let me take the second one now. Um, um, in this, Sally, my partner, will remember this, but I had a colleague at PSR back in the 1980s who heard this argument way back then. And Alex said, uh, well, it's ridiculous to think that you know we can make nuclear weapons safer because what do they do? They're designed to blow people up. So in some ways, the argument <laughs> worst is, thing is, you can, is to make them work. The worst thing you can do is make them work. But when people talk about nuclear weapons safety, what they're talking about is um, features to the warhead design that prevent an accidental det detonation. If, let's say, it's a gravity bomb and it's being carried by a fighter jet, if the jet crashes, you don't want it to explode. If um, there's gunshots on the ground and a bullet hits the warheads, you, know, you don't want that to detonate it. Uh, if there is a fire in the missile silo, you don't want that to detonate the warhead. So the safety features that have been built into the, there have been safety features built into the warheads. The warheads are about as safe as they can be from accidental detonation. Um, they're also pretty safe against a terrorist firing one. It's pretty difficult to get an ICBM based on a ballistic missile somewhere. So, um, you know, I think it's it, it, it's it's not a strong argument, but yeah, you're going to run into this. And um, you know, one way to come back at it is to say that, well, so long as we have these nuclear weapons, yes, the basic work to maintain them should be conducted, but we cannot conduct that work in a way in which we preserve them forever. And that's the problem. You know? So um, I would try to brush aside that argument and say, you know, Mr. Senator, Mr. Congressperson, um, the question that I need you to answer is, do you believe we should be spending $1.2 trillion over the next 30 years, and not on my daughter's education or the roads or um, do you believe that we need to have 1,400 nuclear weapons uh, to deter Russia? Do you believe we should have, I mean, I would fire the questions yes. back and ask for a reply and ask what is, um, uh, what, is you know, what is the senator doing to address this? Are they comfortable with Donald Trump having his finger on the nuclear button? I'm not. So I think that will force them, at the very least, to take this up the chain, to think about what, which one of these bills that we're talking about they might support, at least to satisfy you know, the, the constituent that just walked in the door. 
Um, and the other thing, you know, that's important is you don't have to be an expert to deal with these issues to ask these basic questions. And um, when you walk into a congressional office and you meet with a staff person, you're on the telephone. I mean, it's their job to actually treat you with respect and you voted in the next election. So um, they're going to take your questions seriously. Um, and I think what matters in the end is can we generate the numbers of people walking in and talking and asking these questions, um, given the huge numbers of constituents who are calling in about all sorts of issues. I mean, we're competing here on this nuclear weapons issue, uh, not against, but uh, with other worthy causes. And so that's why, actually, for me, it's very encouraging to see so many people out here today. So other thoughts, suggestions? Yes, Sally. Um, it's my understanding that we got into the mess of nuclear weapons modernization because President Obama was trying to push through a new start and the conservative Congress wouldn't agree to it. So um, is it worth holding their feet to the fire and saying you don't get the weapons modernization money if you don't have arms control agreements? Or is that a double bargain and we just want to forget we ever made that? Well, this is an important point and it's an argument that some Senate Democrats are making in support of extending the start. So just a little bit of history here. Um, so in 2010, when Barack Obama was at, at negotiated this new agreement with the Russians to modestly lower the number of deployed nuclear weapons, strategic nuclear weapons, Republicans came back and said, well, we might support this if you promise to put forward a plan for maintaining the US nuclear arsenal for the decades to come. Uh, so they were playing political hardball. And so it was Senator John Kyle of Arizona, who retired, but now went back, um, replacing John McCain. Uh, he said, uh, I'm not going to support this, this treaty unless you put forward this plan. So yes, the Obama administration put forward a plan. It was, uh, it was like 85 billion dollars in spending over five years. So that was back in 2010. Okay. So if you're paying attention earlier, the cost over the next 10 years is going to be about $400 billion. So the price tag has gone up a heck of a lot. So what we now see is the Trump administration pursuing this spending plan, this shopping spree of nuclear weapons, and they are not really threatening, but they're not making it clear whether they want to extend the start. So Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey at a hearing back in September said to the administration officials testifying, you know, we had this bargain in 2010. Uh, Republicans demanded spending on nuclear weapons in exchange for new start ratification. We Democrats may not be supporting your nuclear weapons spending plan if you don't agree to extend the New START Treaty. I think that can be a powerful political uh, bludgeon that supporters of the New Strategic Arms Treaty and limits on us Russian arsenals can use. The, the, the danger, however, is if Menendez says, all right, you extend a New START, so I will support your bomber program, your ICBM program, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be careful to not to get into that trap. But it, it is a powerful political weapon that I think the Democrats can and will use, and they're going to use it because the Democrats now control the House, and the, the Democrats control half of the congressional purse strings over these budget budget line items. So that's, you know, you know that's some inside baseball, um, and Sal is revealing some of our dinner time conversations about these issues, but it's an important aspect of this conversation. Yeah. So I um, just wanted to amplify a little bit on some of the uh, excess spending issues. And I think it's important to realize that that $1.2 trillion over the next 30, that was, a, that was a forecast that was under the Obama administration. If you look at what the Trump administration is planning, and we really haven't seen the levels of the budgets go up in the, the nuclear arena quite as much as they're likely to in the next coming years. But what the Nuclear Posture Review um, does really 
calls for a lot of new nuclear weapons and expanded production in the nuclear weapons complex site that I work at. For example, we have uh, had a, in place a, a low level of production of the cores of nuclear weapons, the so-called nuclear pits. And that is going to, under the nuclear posture review plans of the Trump administration, quadruple. And um, so the good thing about the spending, which Daryl also mentioned, is that we now have at least one House that's Democrat. And this is something that every year there's a budget that's approved to the appropriations process. So every member of Congress gets to vote on some of these specifics um, in terms of the budget. So it's a process that even without a specific bill, you can enter, and I encourage you all to do that and pay attention to what's coming up um, this spring. Yeah, the prices are going to going to go up. I mean, it's just the, the numbers are incredible, and um, the Arms Control Association is about to uh, about to launch a, a new report and a website that will be up and available by January. Um, the website is going to be U.S. Nuclear Access. Um, you can find it through our our armscontrol.org website. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to be providing information about the projected costs, and this will allow us to update the estimates on those costs. And we'll be outlining um, strategies by which the, the cost can be lowered and the, the stockpile numbers can be reduced. Um, and so that, that might be a good tool going into 2019 to refer to. And that's available by January, you said? It'll be, we're working hard on it. My, my <laughs> colleague is working hard on it. Yeah, it should be up and available by January. And I can make sure that uh, through Jean Athey that those of you who registered get the announcement about the, the launch. So it's, but it's, um, you know, we have this fact sheet here that this is a, this is on our website, by the way. Um, this is just a printout. Um, so these are some of the, the basic numbers, uh, but they're going to, as, as Kathy said, they're going to they're going to change because the cost of these programs, uh, every defense department program ever created, the costs always go up. The schedules get extended. Uh, and I think that you guys have you and Bill. Yeah, sure. Maybe this is trying to solve a big problem by trying to solve an even bigger problem, but is there any potential for trying to lobby about, under, about resolving some of the underlying political differences that are uh, making people feel that uh, we need these weapons? I mean, not just the levels of weapons, the, the spending, but just trying to work towards a better relationship with Russia, China, North Korea. Is there any room for lobbying or, acting or organizing around those? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think um, in the long term, yes. Mm -hmm. In the short term, it's a little more difficult because the relationship with Russia is so abysmal at the moment. Right. The reality is that, um, well, so, so, but I, I think this, this in, in, in making the case for this, uh, the extension of the New Star Treaty, this argument works. Okay, sure. go to Sanger Ford. <clears throat> when you walk into the office or you're talking to fellow citizens, yes, the relationship with Russia is bad. The Russians are bad in a number of different ways. But we need to maintain a steady, rational uh, plan for how we regulate this dangerous nuclear relationship. And we need to have a treaty in place and inspections of one another's arsenals in place so that we don't move into worst case scenario planning, right? Like the Russians are hiding some weapons and we need to respond. Or the Russians are building a new weapon system and we need to respond and we get into uh, action reaction. So I think you know that's that's part of it. Um, but more broadly I think uh, you know what needs to happen is that um, we and Ira Alton was talking about this obliquely, is we need to engage in a dialogue with Russia and with China, and this has to happen between India and Pakistan, on how to maintain stability. That is, how do we make sure that one side or the other doesn't screw up? Um, how do we explain to one another what we're doing uh, with our new types of weapon systems, cyber, weapons, missile defense, hypersonic glide vehicles. I haven't really told you about 
the next thing we've got to worry about, which is missiles that can arrive not in 20 minutes, but in five minutes, okay, that you can't stop. Okay, that's the next weapons technology. <coughs> so that's the longer term strategy. So I think one of the things that you might, you know, if you have the opportunity to be talking about with some mainly Senate offices who think about this, is we need to have what I would, I would use the word strategic stability talks with Russia. Uh, and that basically just means a dialogue about the issues of concern to avoid the possibility that one side believes uh, you know, they're vulnerable to attack. So, Bill. Short preference, I apologize. Uh, I don't have the capacity to go online and learn anything. Uh, I just checked your handout, and I didn't see uh, the Armed Controls Association website, but I could not, if it was included in that, I could not go on it and learn it. Uh, I, I, didn't pay the, I didn't pay Bill to, 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 to put up our website. I was drawn to this workshop <laughs> because the agenda, I think, suggested that this workshop, this breakout session, was going to deal with who profits from uh, yeah. the national security uh, stuff. And uh, that's why. <laughs> I can remember 50 years ago or so, uh, there was research done on the war economy, and uh, it was spread around. There were lists provided. Uh, if you live in this state or that state, uh, what are the corporate elements in that state, and how much they contribute to the war in Vietnam and other wars. And I've not seen anything like that recently. I'd love to see that. I don't know if it's on your website. But I know in Maryland there are numerous military installations, large and small. Uh, there are, if not headquarters, there are numerous corporate elements that have substantial, uh, uh, maybe it's only office, it's, they're not actually building anything, but uh, Northrop, Lockheed, uh, Boeing probably. I, anyway, I would love for somebody to provide me and people who are interested in seeing it, uh, just where are the corporate national security element is across the country, or in around the world. I don't know if there are equivalent NGOs, say, in Russia, or in India, or in Pakistan, or in Israel, that uh, are, and France, and England. Uh, that would be great. But, uh, all right, so we, so we don't have that on our website. That's not what we do. But others have some of this information, OK? And this is actually very difficult to document. But I want to, Ray. I'm going to put you on the spot here because I think it's an opportunity to talk about something else, okay? Which is, I mean, as I said, I think in answer to the first question, the, the military industrial complex is everywhere. Um, and they have a constituency on the hill. And um, the question is, what, what do we do about it? The is next door to each of us. There are people who feel they have a job because of the war economy. And this is true. But, one thing we can do to avoid being part of that war economy is to think about whether our uh, investments and our banking are involved in the companies that do business. And so there's an initiative that's been launched in the Netherlands, but it's coming to a, a bank near you. Daryl, <laughs> excuse yeah. me, can I just uh, We have five minutes, sorry, so this minutes. is a good place to, to, to wrap up on. So, okay. Ray, if you could tell us about it. Sure, okay. yeah, it is actually global. Um, it's called Don't Bank on the Bomb, and the resources are online. <laughs> so I don't know um, if we can share those in some other way after this meeting. Yeah. But uh, it's, a, it's a resource that you can look at all the companies that are producing nuclear weapons, most of which, or many of which, are American companies, US companies, um, and the banks that are investing in them, the pension funds that are investing in them, mm -hmm. other financial institutions that are giving money to these companies. And the idea is that you can call your bank um, if it's making investments, ask them to change their policies, ask them why they invest in nuclear weapons. Um, some of them have divested from fossil fuels, divested from landmines or cluster munitions, but they haven't yet divested from nuclear weapons because they don't know about the new treaty that outlaws them or because they just are making too much money from it. So it's good to have the pressure on these financial institutions um, it also has a hall of fame, so good banks where you can transfer money to. In the United States, I'm pretty sure there's only one bank right now that is not investing in any nuclear weapon producers, and that's Amalgamated Bank. I don't know if you have that in Maryland. We have it in New York State. Yeah, there might be there might be little a few little ones. Yeah, so Amalgamated is a labor bank. So it's finding more community-minded banks that you can put your money in. Um, 
another uh, area of work with Don't Bank on the Bomb is doing city level divestment. So I'll talk about this a little bit this afternoon, but um, in New York City, for example, we're working on getting the city council to withdraw all of its city pension funds, so firefighters, cops, teachers, from the um, financial institutions or from the companies that are investing in nuclear weapons. So there's a few different areas of work going on. The website is still bankonthebomb.com, and it does have all the global information. We've had great success so far. A lot of European banks in particular have been very responsive to this. Um, two of the largest pension funds in Europe, in Norway and the Netherlands, um, at the federal level, even though those governments aren't yet supporting the nuclear ban treaty, they've <coughs> pulled their pension funds from uh, from these companies. So there is really positive work going on, and it's something everybody can participate in. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way for individuals to have an impact and to make other people aware of the fact that, you know, who is involved. Um, I mean, the other thing that, I mean, we've done with our organization have a small endowment and we have directed our investment advisors to make sure that we, are, we the Arms Control Association, are not investing in defense contractors. I mean, so a lot of people have individual retirement investments. <coughs> and that's another question. If you have an advisor to say, I want to put my money in a um, don't bank in the bomb type of funds. And I don't think that's where you guys have gone quite yet with this project, but maybe that's the next phase because that's another way to uh, expand this, this concept. So we have like one minute. One and a half. We're going to have one quick question, <laughs> and I, then I want to thank two quick questions. All right, go, please. Uh, I have a very fundamental question. Uh, I noticed that uh, in the uh, um, Minuteman um, um, warheads, there's no more powerful W87 warheads. What's the average yield for, for, for that workout? About 100 kilotons. So for Hiroshima, it was 15 kilotons. So um, these are much larger on average. The warheads on, on the land-based missiles and the submarine is much larger. And, um, and what was the Hiroshima about? About 15 kilotons. We're lucky enough to get this treaty done worldwide. How are they going to? People will uh, want to do things. So how are they going to detect if another nation is building something in secret? That's a good question. The, the Prohibition Treaty of Nuclear Weapons does not spell out how we verify the elimination of nuclear weapons. It, creates an opening for negotiations on a monitoring and verification regime. There's research that has been done about how this can take place. Technically, it's possible, um, but the, the problem is the political will to eliminate. Uh, and there have not been technical conversations between the nuclear armed states about how this would be done uh, as yet. So. That's a future challenge um, that we've got to we've got to tackle. I mean, I would just say this as you know, somebody's been working on this subject for 30 years. I don't know exactly how we're going to eliminate nuclear weapons. I don't know what all of the political, how the political challenges and technical challenges are going to be tackled. I think they can be. Uh, we need to keep moving as fast as possible in that direction and create the, the legal framework. To get there, um, but um, you know, that can't be the the obstacle that prevents us from taking the next steps. But it's one that you know uh, the students was the students was Goucher. All right, you're going to have to solve this for us. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a science, we're in the science building. So I mean, this is a this is going to be a decades long challenge. Um, and, but we need to move, as, as Ira Hoffman said, with alacrity because the nature of the threat is real and it's still very severe. And I know that's not a satisfying question answer, but that's the best I can do. I was hoping you would say there was something that the scientific they could do from space mm -hmm. that would detect and differentiate 
between the levels of uranium or whatever. There are techniques that allow for the detection of at close range of nuclear material. But, but we don't have those systems in place because we don't have the agreements and the political will to get to that. So I think we're out of time. We're going to go. Time, people. A nice lunch okay, waiting downstairs. We have downstairs. lunch coming. I want to thank everybody for your great questions. Thank and you. I encourage you.